Welcome to Italics, television for the Italian American experience. I'm your host, Anthony Tamburri. We open this episode with the following quote. Despite modern America having made some progress addressing the vast abuses and injustices of our past, the darkness of white supremacy that has been our nation's scores from its founding, and the violence that is its constant shadow still grows. Racist embers were stoked during the 2016 presidential campaign and subsequent election of Donald Trump. Trump's rhetoric, hateful tropes, and dog whistle talking points provided oxygen for a resurgent American hate movement led by members of the alt-right and white nationalists. But while racial tensions feel particularly dangerous right now, it's important to remember that they are not new. I should know. 30 years ago, I was complicit in spreading similar seeds of intolerance. For eight years of my life, and despite the fact that I was not raised in a racist environment, I was a hateful and violent white supremacist. These are the words of Christian Picciolini, author of White American Youth, My Descent into America's Most Violent Hate Movement, and How I Got Out of It, published in 2017. Christian Picciolini is an MSNBC contributor, an Emmy Award-winning director and producer, a published author, TEDx speaker, global peace activist, and a reformed extremist. His work and life purpose bears witness to a deep-seated desire to atone for his grisly past. In 2009, he co-founded Life After Hate, a nonprofit organization dedicated to helping other organizations and communities implement long-term solutions that counter racism and violent extremism. We met up with Christian at the Calandra Institute, where he read from and discussed his book, White American Youth. He took out a folded piece of paper and a pen from his jeans pocket and scribbled the word centurion on it. And Roman women are divine goddesses, he added with a sly smile. That much I knew. I cracked a slight grin as he thrust the paper into my hand. Go to the library and look it up. Then come find me and tell me what you've learned about yourself and your glorious people. The kid's cool, Clark. They're waiting for us. We should go. Well, Christian Picciolini, he said, grasping my clammy hand. I'm Clark Martell, and I'm going to save your f***ing life. Welcome to Italics. Thanks, Anthony. What was your upbringing like? Gosh, uh, well, I grew up uh, as an Italian-American kid on the south side of Chicago. Uh, my parents came to the U.S. in the mid-1960s. Uh, my father from Salerno area and my mother uh, from near Potenza. And uh, they settled on the south side of Chicago. And it was a very good family upbringing. There was a lot of love. I was surrounded uh, with a lot of family, except my parents, who as immigrants had to work very, very hard. Yeah. Uh, so they were gone seven days a week, 14 hours a day. And uh, that caused me to really grow up feeling abandoned uh, by my parents, even though now looking back, I certainly understand uh, what they had to do. But at that age, I wondered what I had done mm -hmm. to push them away. And uh, I started to act out. And one day when I was 14 years old, uh, I was recruited into America's first neo-Nazi skinhead gang uh, by America's first neo-Nazi skinhead leader. There's a little sort of strange, comical, uncanny episode to how you got recruited. Yeah, right? I was standing in an alley, <laughs> literally uh, in, a, in an alley, a dead-end alley behind the corners of Union and Division Streets, if mm -hmm. you can believe the irony in that. Uh, and I was standing there one night, and I was smoking a joint, and uh, this car came racing down the alley, and it stopped. And uh, the guy came over, and all I saw was, you know, a shaved head and, yeah. and boots. And, and he walked over to me, and he pulled a joint from my mouth, and he looked me in the eyes, and he said, and I'll never forget this, that's what the communists and the Jews want you to do to keep you docile. I have to be honest with you, Anthony, I was 14 years old. I didn't know what a communist yeah. or, or, or if I yeah. even met a Jewish person having gone to Catholic school yeah. my whole life. And I didn't even know what the word docile meant. Um, but here was this guy who, who really was trying to kind of feed my vulnerabilities a little bit. He recognized that. And, um, you know, he started to pull me in by saying that I should be proud of who I was. And I was, mm -hmm. of course. It's kind of all I knew in my Italian bubble was, you know, the fact that my ancestors were gladiators and artists and thinkers and, and musicians. And 
and he really played on that. He, he would start to tell me that people wanted to take that away from me, mm -hmm. even though I'd never seen that before. I, I didn't understand it, but I still bought in because it was the first time I felt in my life that somebody really paid attention to me. And, you, and your parents were hardworking, as you said. They were. They opened a business. They were the all-American success story. These yeah. two Italian immigrants come over and Never meet asking here. for help right. from anybody, yeah. making yeah. it on their pulled own. Their own bootstraps, pulled themselves yeah. up by their bootstraps, et cetera. Well, you know, I'd felt so marginalized growing up. You know, growing up as a, as a first generation American, uh, which I think most people don't know, but 25% but of, of young people under 20 are either first generation or second generation Americans. Oh, that's interesting. That's a whole lot of identity crisis. If we're yeah. living with one foot in our parents' old world and, and trying to, you know, find a way to fit in into a new world. Please, God, I beg you, don't let my mother show up with another McDonald's Happy Meal at lunchtime today. But these words apparently never had enough time to travel from my mouth to his ears because every day, like clockwork, when the bell rang and my class streamed into the lunchroom to eat, there my mom would be, stationed at the door, hurrying toward me, her long leather jacket looking stylish to nobody but herself, and her blonde hair sticking out at odd angles because she'd rushed out of the beauty shop in the middle of a self-dye job. Her high-heeled boots would hit the polished linoleum floor with sharp staccato notes tapping out impending doom. This particular day was no different. Jake Riley tripped me as we lined up for the cafeteria. What's for lunch, lick my weenie? He sneered. I wish they'd go back to Italy and let me fend for myself, or that they'd let me move in with my grandparents. One of the things your book speaks to is also the value of family. Yeah because you go off this path of violence, extremism, racism, and so on and so forth. Searching for a family, too. Search, yeah, mm -hmm. yeah, but when you hit bottom, rock yeah. bottom, you can go home. Well, it's because your family is typically yeah. the only yeah. group or the only people that will you know, stay by you. Yeah. I had kind of traded them in for this sense of family with this group and, and you know, felt respected and felt important, but it was all perceived. It was yeah. not power, it yeah. was weakness. Yeah. Uh, and when I needed them the most, you know, they weren't yeah. there. You got drawn in mm -hmm. because you had potholes. Potholes, yeah. yeah. We have a lot of them in Chicago. I think yeah. you have a lot here in New York, yes. too, on the streets. But the potholes that I'm talking about are, yeah. are those things that we encounter in our life's journey that might be insurmountable, or they tend to kind of nudge us off of our life's path. And, you know, sometimes they detour us down a really dark alley when we're looking for that identity, community, and purpose. And potholes can be anything, like trauma. It could be uh, extreme privilege. It can be uh, psychological unwellness. It can be abandonment. It can really be anything. Uh, and if we can't find the right resources to help navigate those potholes, then sometimes we get really lost. So it's a question of self-identity. Something you every young family. person goes yeah. through. Yeah. You talk about being caught between two worlds. I did feel like I was caught between two worlds, and I loved both of them. Mm -hmm. uh, I just didn't know which one was the right one. I didn't know. You know, I think at that age, and, and everybody goes through this, we want to be somebody. We want to be part of something, and we want to have meaning. Yeah. Uh, and I wasn't finding that anywhere else, and I wasn't finding it in the Italian community, even though that was really what I grew up in, and it was my first love. Uh, so I went outside of it, and I, I, frankly, I chased the opposite of, of how I'd been raised. So I want to ask you about two statements of yours. Sure. One is, good people end up doing bad things. The other is, hatred is born of ignorance. Fear is its father, and isolation is its mother. I love that expression. Thank you. Yeah. You know, I really, did, I'll start with the second one, but I think, uh, you know, hatred really is born of ignorance. If we are afraid of what we don't understand, and we never give ourselves the opportunity to understand it, to enjoy it, to, to know whether we like it or not, uh, you know, that, that type of ignorance is really kind of inflaming this, this hatred. Uh, and, you know, unfortunately, you know, the second quote, good, uh, good people do bad things, I mean, really kind of both of those quotes encompass what we're going through right now in the world where, uh, you know, there's been this fear and this tension that's been, you know, frankly, it's never gone away. It's, all, it's always been there. And, you know, while a lot of people want to blame, you know, Trump for, for uh, you know, causing this, uh, 
he really is just a symptom of something that's been happening for, for yeah. a very, very long time. And, um, you know, I think that there are a lot of people that are good that are getting in, lumped into bad things right now uh, because we're so polarized. I mean, we're, we're being forced to choose a team, really. Yeah. You know, and yeah. frankly, we're all kind of in the middle normally, uh, depending on what the issue is. Uh, and uh, that sometimes can cause good people to do bad things. When mm -hmm. there's despair, when they feel like their lives are stunted, when they're living in a world of confusion, um, and they feel like they're losing an identity, kind of like I thought I was, that typically is a really good breeding ground for violent extremism. Or good extremism. people not to do anything. Or good people to right. not do anything. To not do or anything. to be complicit yeah. inside. Right, right, exactly. There's an interesting twist in your life because you fall in love with a woman. Oh, yeah. And that takes you a little bit off the path of white supremacy, extremism. And then at a certain point, you open up a record store. Yeah, I, you know, at 19 years old, uh, yeah. when I got married, uh, you know, to, to my Irish wife, I think all <laughs> Italians marry Irish women for some reason, I don't know why that is. Uh, but, uh, you know, we had two sons and, and I decided I was going to open a record store. I started to really question that whole sense of identity, community and purpose. Was I a hate monger or was I a father and a husband? Uh, and I opened a store that sold white power music because I was still not brave enough to, to disengage. Everything starts basically in Germany, right? Yeah. And in the 90s, when you've got your record store, that's still the point, the location of everything, it seems to me. From the 80s to the 90s, um, music was like a flamethrower of propaganda. Yeah. It was a way to get a, a propaganda message out to educate people, but it was also the social media of the time because the only way we would get together with people we knew around the country was to have these concerts, mm -hmm. uh, which there weren't a lot, uh, you know, a couple, of, one or two a year and, and people would come in and that was our Facebook, that was our way to connect with each other um, and music really drove that. Um, it was, you know, it was a way to release angst but also to indoctrinate people. This racist music drew me in when I was 14 yeah. because it seemed to be important to me at the time. And it's uh, essentially what drew me out of the movement too because after I opened this record store, I had to sell other music like hip hop and punk rock and heavy metal. Uh, and, um, you know, customers came in to buy that despite knowing exactly what I was about. And it was those people who came in who I would normally have kept outside of my social circle, mm -hmm. African Americans or Jewish people or gay people. And it was them who showed me the compassion uh, when I least deserved it. And they were the people that, frankly, I least deserved it from. And that was the most transformative thing for me. Mm -hmm. That's the hatred, ignorance, and yeah. fear. Yeah. I was afraid of them, uh, so I hated them. But once I got to know them, I couldn't reconcile my prejudice anymore. Mm -hmm. yeah. I became embarrassed. I pulled it. Yeah. And uh, I had to close the store because it was 75% of, of my sales. Uh, and I couldn't sustain the store anymore. And, and I used that opportunity of closing the store uh, and also the fact that at that point my wife had left me uh, yeah. because I didn't make the right decision uh, to choose my family over the movement. Um, but I used that whole um, kind of everything collapsing the store, my wife leaving me uh, to leave the movement. Mm -hmm. Now when I looked into the mirror I saw a hollow shell of a man, a stranger, filled with all of those same toxic elements staring back at me. For one third of my life, I'd chewed and swallowed grisly bits of each one of those twisted ideologies, and now all I felt like doing was jamming my fingers down my throat and vomiting them all up into the nearest toilet. I felt sick, like a dope fiend detoxing from selfish power and control instead of heroin, always needing more and blindly living my life on a razor's edge to score the next hateful fix. You know, here I am, this ex-Nazi skinhead with, you know, six high schools under my belt because I got kicked out of all of them, one of them twice. Uh, I had uh, no computer. I was fully tattooed, you know, no education whatsoever. And a friend of mine said, you know, because I'd been waking up for five years after I left, uh, miserable. I was depressed. I wanted to not wake up. And a friend came to me and she said, you know, I don't want to see you die. Uh, go apply for a job where I just started working, this small company called IBM. <laughs> you know? And I said, are you crazy? Why would they hire somebody yeah. like me? You know, I had no redeeming qualities whatsoever. 
And she said, just go. And I did. And she said, go tell them that, you know, you're really charismatic and good with people. And, and I said, okay, sure. And I got the job. Uh, and the first, I was so excited, the first place they were going to put me uh, was my old high school. And then I was not excited anymore. <laughs> um, they had no idea about my past, but we were going to be installing all the computers mm -hmm. for, for the school district. And, mm -hmm. and it was starting at my old high school. And suddenly I became terrified because I knew that somebody was going to recognize me and you know, I'd lose everything yeah. that, you know, that was good again. Uh, and of course, within the first few minutes, you know, who walks by me but the old uh, black security guard, Mr. Johnny Holmes, who I'd gotten in a fist fight with that got me let out in handcuffs and kicked out of that school for the second time. And I didn't know what to do. I didn't, I, you know, I didn't, I'd tried to outrun my past, even though I was treating people with respect and, you know, I wasn't treating myself with very much respect. But I followed him to the parking lot and, uh, when I tapped him on the shoulder, he turned around and he was afraid. He took a step back. He recognized He you. recognized me at that point. Um, and all I could think to say, uh, you know, was, I'm sorry. Uh, and we talked a little bit more and he extended his hand and I shook it and, you know, we talked some more and then we embraced and cried. What happened to me really could happen to any young person, poor, privileged, black, white, Asian, whatever, because, you know, as we're searching for these things, sometimes we get uh, let off track. You had emphasized the fact that we use the word terrorism only for foreigners who mm -hmm. strike the U.S., right? And you use that term, white Terrorist, terrorism. Yeah. yeah. Well, it's something that, you know, we don't do. First of all, we don't have uh, a domestic terrorism statute in the United States to be able to charge, uh, you know, homegrown extremists with terrorism. Um, and the definition of terrorism is, is to conduct an act of violence or terror uh, based on an ideology to influence or scare other people, right. right? Somebody like a Timothy McVeigh, who was a white supremacist, was a supporter and sympathizer of the Aryan nations, which is something we don't really talk about in relation to that story. Um, even Dylan Roof, who walked into a church and murdered nine innocent people, left a manifesto, did it based on ideological reasons, was not charged with uh, any form of terrorism. However, you know, when we watch the news and one of these tragic events happens and it is a person of color that's doing it, uh, you know, the T word is thrown around quite a bit, uh, even before the facts are in. Uh, and, you know, I'm not saying that that terrorism doesn't exist. It's a problem. Mm -hmm. But in America, more people have been killed since 9-11 uh, on American soil by white supremacists than by any other foreign or domestic terrorist group combined by a factor of two. And I don't think that is well known. No, no. And I do blame, you know, the government for not having that kind of yeah. legislation. Um, but I also, you know, I look at the media um, because, you know, they're not calling it terrorism, but instead they're using words like alt-right and white right. nationalist, which are words that they came up with, these groups, right. to make themselves seem less hateful. Yes. They're marketing terms. Yes. When in reality, they're white supremacists. Right. And most recently, of course, we saw that the New Yorker Festival mm -hmm. had um, originally invited uh, Steve, Steve Bannon, Bannon to come Bannon, speak. Right. Yeah. And of course, there was this brouhaha and all the, all the famous celebrities, whatever, said, I'm not coming. Right. right, and they disinvited. So they disinvited him. Right. Right. And some right. people said, oh, free speech, whatever. I suspect, though, if Steve Bannon hadn't been given the exposure by Donald Trump, he would still be running the number one far-right propaganda machine of which Breitbart, Breitbart. Uh, which is instrumental. Uh, and I know because they've written about me in ways that, you know, are, are like the National Enquirer, uh, you know, calling me a paid uh, Israeli Mossad agent and, a, you know, an Antifa terrorist. And this all is these after things. you. Left. This is after, yeah. you know. That, to me, is more nefarious than the words that a person standing in the corner might be using because that infects people that don't even know what they're being infected by. Mm -hmm. And that yeah. to me is more dangerous. Our strategy 30 years ago, and I've been talking about this for 20 years, uh, very publicly, was to blend in. It was to go, to move away from what I used to be, the very visible kind of inciting terror on view kind of person, you know. Mm -hmm. You'd see me walking down the street or a bunch of skinheads, you would know what was coming. Uh, however, the new movement has, uh, you know, has really learned how to blend in, how to mainstream, and it's almost like mainlining a drug. They've injected themselves into society, and it's flown through every part of us. Uh, and with a president who they feel, you know, really speaks their language and supports them, 
um, they've now decided they're going to come out again. Uh, and, and here we are with a problem, uh, frankly, that I've never seen before. Uh, not in any time that I was involved or in the 23 years since. Um, it's created a social movement uh, of young white males uh, and girls um, who are completely lost and fighting in this kind of populist far-right battle. Um, and I can't tell you how many you know, mothers who are Jewish call me and, and tell me their son or their daughter came home with a swastika tattoo or are denying the Holocaust. Mm -hmm. uh, and then I would beg somebody to tell me that this is really about ideology, it's not. It is about identity, community, and purpose and being lost. Mm -hmm. And then some savvy recruiter uh, who knows exactly where to go and who to hunt for um, draws you in. There's the boys. I like that hat, man. I like that hat. We send delegate skinheads to every high school. We go and we talk to these young people in their high school. We give them literature. We get them started. We give them a phone number that they can reach that's not anywhere else. They go and they start their own white youth gangs. About 75% of the people that I work with, because now uh, I work to help people disengage. Right, in 2009, you yeah. founded Life After Hate. Right, and now I run uh, the Free Radicals Project, which is a global <coughs> intervention network. Uh, and I've helped over 200 people disengage. And I can tell you 75% of the people that I get requests from, whether it's family members looking for help or them, uh, are, are battling with some kind of uh, you know, psychological issue, whether it's uh, living with autism or Asperger's or schizophrenia or bipolar. Um, it's, it's prevalent, but it's not only prevalent in the white supremacist movement, it's prevalent in all extremist movements from the Islamic State mm -hmm. uh, to school shooters, to cults, to, to all, all of these places that know exactly how to target people who are vulnerable, who are looking for inclusion. So the two operative words for you are empathy and compassion. How did you know? <laughs> how did you know? <laughs> Uh, yeah. You know, ca cautious empathy yeah. and cautious compassion, I think. You know, certainly uh, we, we have to learn, I think, if we ever want to beat this, we have to learn how to see the child and not the monster, whether that child is six or 60, <laughs> because nobody's born to hate, we learn it. Uh, and if we write everybody off who does something we don't agree with or, you know, something awful, like I did, I did plenty of awful things. If we write those people off and don't give them an opportunity to at least listen to what it is that led them down that path, um, and that doesn't mean we're enabling them, uh, then we have a problem that we're never going to find a solution to um, because we don't help monsters, but we yeah. can't help broken people. You say on a number of occasions, my foreign last name. Hmm. You got teased in oh school, boy. right? Because of your foreign last name. Well, you know, with a name like Picholini, of course, it sounds Picholini, like anything, well, anything we need. Yes, you know, you, exactly. The, the, the possibilities are <laughs> endless for ridicule. Yeah. You know, not yeah. to mention I was the only kid, you know, growing up way before it was cool to bring Nutella and, and right. uh, dried and, and, salami to, right, for lunch, right, you know, exactly. like, like the yeah. hip kids are doing today. But yeah, um, yeah it, was, it was difficult growing yeah. up. Uh, but I'm glad that I grew up the way that I did because, uh, you know, I really am very proud of my parents and their struggle, and, and uh, you know, I, I hope that I've taken some of that inspiration and, and you know, mm -hmm. taught my kids that. It makes you chuckle momentarily, but it's a real serious um, episode that you recount where um, your mother finally confronts you on your uh, adoration of Hitler yeah. and says, find a hero, even Al Capone. Yeah, you know, right? at that point, I think yeah. she, she came to me and she said, you yeah. know, I don't understand all this yeah. Hitler nonsense. Right. Why, why are you so interested? Right. Well, yeah. she said, you know, why can't you at least like somebody like Al Capone? <laughs> at least he's Italian. And I, yeah. You know, at that point, I was just, I thought she was crazy. But yeah, it uh, sort of underscored the whole. She was yeah. so desperate that, yeah. that if I was going to be bad, at least I should be bad with, with something that she recognized. Yeah. I saw three epiphanies in the book. You start feeling guilty guilty about your association with white extremism. Mm
you know yeah, yeah I, I had questions every day that I was involved Anthony it was yeah. uh, it was not something easy for me to accept there was a sentence where you said this was where I guess just after your divorce where you ate for Lisa more than you did a white homeland yeah. and I went whoa <laughs> and it's love is all there is it comes back to the empathy and compassion yeah. which are small smaller forms of love in a sense right you know, we, we end up hurting the people yeah. uh, that we love the yeah. most. And uh, at that point, after I had lost her and, and my kids, uh, I recognized that, that, that she and, and, and my boys were the only important things in my life. And yeah. that that's what I needed to focus on. Yeah. And nothing else that I was pursuing had any validity, had any value, uh, or was even worth it. Yeah. Um, and certainly it didn't fit in with who I was. Uh, but uh, yeah, you know, unfortunately, we, you know, we do those things and yeah. we, we lose them. And then the third for me was towards the end of the book where you say you finally realized that this was a distorted ideology that you were following. I made myself believe whatever I needed to believe uh, to, to maintain that status, to maintain that, that sense of respect that I thought mm -hmm. I was getting, which was, you know, certainly not real respect. Mm -hmm. um, you know, when you realize you've been fooled, um, not just, you know, over an instant, but for eight years. Big time. You know, yeah. essentially my whole life at that point. Yeah, your whole adolescence. Um, I, I, I wouldn't wish that on anybody to, to really say, what have I done? And not only have I been fooled, but I've hurt people because of that. And not only did I physically hurt people, but I hurt people that I drew in who were vulnerable young kids who probably wouldn't have gone down that path had it not been for me. You've met up with some of these people afterwards, huh? I would meet uh, people over time, uh, just like I, I met people on the street when I was in the movement, but now, you know, I had my eyes wide open and I was able to see the commonalities and, and recognize the differences that really, to me, were beautiful. You know, it was things like music and food and, yeah. and literature and, and art and culture, all the things that I always loved, you know, that I was proud of of my own mm -hmm. culture. Mm -hmm. And uh, it's amazing what you can see if you actually keep your eyes open. Yeah. You have two sons. Two boys. They're in their 20s. They're going to be 26 and 24 this year. Yeah. Uh, and uh, I couldn't be more proud of them. They're, they're amazing uh, young men. And clearly they've read the book. Well, I they were the first ones to read the yeah. first draft yeah. of it when they were 12 and I think 14. Oh, so. okay. Yeah. So that had to be interesting. It was important. It was always important yeah. for me to, to speak to them about my Let life. Let them know. Mm -hmm. Not only because I didn't want them to find out on their own, well, but also because I wanted to make sure that they you know, weren't getting those kinds of influences from other mm -hmm. people in their mm -hmm. lives. And Good. One more question. Sure. Joni Jack. You know, Joan Jett, who is a woman who's in the Rock and Roll yeah. Hall of Fame, you know, after I left the movement, one of the only things that I knew how to do was play music, because that's what I did in the movement. I wrote music. And so I started a, a, a non-political punk rock band after I left, just to get my angst out. And one of our first concerts was opening up for Joan Jett. And I was still miserable, Anthony. I was depressed, and I wanted, you know, to take my life. And after our sound check, she came up to us before the show started, and she, she noticed. She recognized that I wasn't in a good place, and she mm -hmm. came up to me, and, and she asked me what was wrong, and we talked, and, and she asked us to come on tour because she really enjoyed our sound check, and, and frankly, it was something that I needed at that time uh, because it moved me forward when I was moving backwards a lot, and um, you know, about a year after I left the movement, I'd been divorced, and I was miserable, and, and uh, she doesn't know it, but she saved my life, and I didn't tell her until about 20 years after yeah, that happened yeah. uh, when I asked her to write the foreword for the book. She said, why did I not know? And I said, well, because I didn't tell anybody for a long time. Yeah. Well, it's a wonderful read. It's a truly all-American story in, in a difficult way, but it has, for the most part, a happy ending, because here you are. Thank, Thank you. you. My pleasure. Mio piacere. Piacere mio. Thanks for watching this episode of Italics. I'm Anthony Tamburri. Arrivederci alla prossima puntata.